Okay, this is chapter 15 from the book, Dr. John McDougall, The Doctor Who Fought for You by me, Pete Rogers. We're talking about chapter 15, osteoporosis and the kidneys. And this is Dr. McDougall here. He says, the main cause of osteoporosis is that people eat too much animal protein. Animal protein is acidic, and the bones are the main buffer system for dietary acid. The kidneys excrete the acid protons, and they simultaneously excrete calcium. So when you have increased calcium excreted into the urine, that's called calciuria. And when you have increased calcium excreted in the urine, number one, you're peeing your bones in the toilet. Number two, the high amount of calcium in the kidney tubules can precipitate. You can form a kidney stone. Uh, you don't want that. You can form a bladder stone. You don't want that. Ureteral stone, you don't want that. And simply the kidneys, uh, the calcifications precipitating in the renal medulla can progressively, gradually lead to kidney failure. Okay, some of these osteoporosis foundations are just extensions of industry. They promote the bone mineral density measurement as a way to sell osteoporosis drugs. The funding to get bone mineral density used as a way to determine fracture risk and make recommendations for prescribing medications was funded by three pharmaceutical companies. And the normal bone mineralization density was based on a woman of only about 30 years of age. Okay, so you can see immediately how bogus that is. A 30-year-old woman is in baby-making phase, so she's going to need higher uh, bone mass to give to the baby. You know, a postmenopausal woman, she doesn't, she's not about to have any babies, so she doesn't need as much bone mass. Okay, so continuing with Dr. McDougall's uh, speech here. Makers of machines to measure bone mineral density have also sponsored some of the promotional research on using bone mineral density. This is medically incorrect, though, because a 30-year-old woman carries around more bone density than a postmenopausal woman. The 30-year-old woman has extra bone density, so it is available for a future baby, potential future baby. Uh, there's no need for a postmenopausal woman to carry that extra bone density. This comes from British Medical Journal, 2002. If one uses the normal standard um, for the bones to be that of a 30-year-old woman, that will make most women sick, have osteoporosis. In women over 50 years of age, it leads to 30% of them being diagnosed with osteoporosis. And women over 65 years of age, it leads to 70% of them being diagnosed or described as having osteoporosis. I don't think, this is Dr. McDougall saying this right here. He does not think, he says, I don't think women should undergo bone mineral density testing. There's a two-third chance they're going to get labeled as sick, as sick, and then there's very little chance they're going to benefit. But there's real risk of harm with these medications. Normal bone mass is to be within one standard deviation of a 30-year-old woman. Osteopenia is to be within 1 to 2.5 standards of a 30-year-old woman. And frank osteoporosis is defined as being 2.5 standard deviations or more below the bone mass of a 30-year-old woman. So if a woman's greater than 2.5 standard deviations below a 30-year-old woman and she has a fracture, then she's labeled as having severe osteoporosis. There are many who recognize that bone mineral density is overrated. For example, the Office of Health Technology at the, uh, here, let me move this text over, at the University of British Columbia wrote that research evidence does not support either whole population or selective bone mineral density testing of well women at or near menopause as a means to predict fractures. Here's another paper that recommends against bone mineral density screening. We do not recommend a program of screening menopausal women for osteoporosis by measuring bone density. Included analyses of 11 separate populations and over 2,000 fractures have found that bone mineral density cannot identify individuals who will have a fracture. So that's pretty powerful stuff. They're, it's totally overdiagnosing women, and it's not that accurate for predicting who's going to have a fracture. You know, and I, I can tell you one of the most common things, I see people falling down all the time. Old guy hit head, old guy hit head, old lady hit head, you know, and also neck pain, fell neck pain. Um, so, yeah, you don't want to fall. If you don't fall, you're unlikely to have a fracture. Okay. Um, bone mineral density can be viewed as a con, and the patient is the mark or the chump. The bone mineral density test is the setup, and the selling of the drug is the payoff. Okay, that's my words because it's, uh, it's enclosed there in a bracket. The bones are the primary calcium buffering system of the body. The kidneys excrete excess nitrogen. Low protein diets reduce the kidney workload and protect the kidney. Dr. Kempner showed this to be true a long time ago. Okay, and some of this came from Dr. McDougall's newsletter, June 2007, How to Save Your Kidneys. 
Animal foods tend to be much more acidic than plant foods. Animal foods have more protein than plant foods. The protein is made out of amino acids. Animal protein has more sulfur containing amino acids like cysteine and methionine. Some of these, the sulfur uh, from these gets metabolized into sulfuric acid and that puts an additional acid load on the body, okay? Um, that's going to give you a metabolic acidosis. The kidneys excrete acidic protons, hydrogen, you know, plus, H plus, and simultaneously they excrete a calcium. So that calcium comes from the bone. Some of it comes from the muscle as well. Um, when the kidneys are excreting more calcium, it's called calciuria, leads to an increased risk of calcium stones. Over 95% of kidney stones contain calcium. PRAL, potential renal acid load, is the acid load of food. And here's a comparison list just for perspective. The renal acid load per 100 calories of a given food, and then you'll notice how much higher it is for animal foods. So you can see here, it's pretty high in all these animal foods. You're looking around uh, 5.6, 6, 10. Okay, now let's take a look at the numbers on some plant foods. Pasta, 7, mixed nuts, 3, peas, 1, wheat flour, 1, white rice, 0.1. Let me go back up to look at those animal food ones. Cheese, 34. Cheese is super acidic. Okay. Uh, cheese is the big acidic one. You can see the nuts are kind of high. Okay. The more negative the number, the better. The lower the number, the better. White rice, less than one. Uh, soy milk, 0.6. Instant oatmeal, 0.2. Quinoa, negative numbers. Now we're getting into negative numbers. Quinoa is negative 0.2, which I'm a little surprised by because it's got a lot of protein. Uh, garlic, negative 3. Potato, negative 5. Potatoes looking good. But bananas, negative 5. Uh, so the more negative, the better in this context. Baked potato, negative 9. Okay, beet greens, negative 17. Kale, negative 11. Okay, so those are very alkaline. And the consequences of this would be those foods would probably be good for cancer patients, you know, depending on the details. But overall, that's going to be more alkaline. In general, normal tissues are favored by, a, by an alkaline milieu, you know, microenvironment. Okay, most of these numbers were taken from Dr. McDougall's chart. Some of them were taken from other charts of PRAL to make the chart more complete. Uh, both charts agreed in the relative amounts, but slightly different in the precise amounts. And the key point is animal foods tend to be very acidic, and we just saw that the nuts were surprisingly acidic, according to this. Beans and grains tend to be minimally acidic, and then fruits and veggies tend to be quite alkaline. And some starches, like potato, are also moderately alkaline. Oxalates in food tend to be bound. If a person eats a low-fat diet, the oxalates tend to stay bound to food and they don't get absorbed. However, if a person eats a high-fat diet, then more of the oxalates separate from the food and get absorbed into the body. The Eskimos, for example, eat a lot of fish. The fish and other animal foods are quite similar to each other, and this means they tend to have a lot of fat and a lot of protein. They get a lot of osteoporosis. In the National Geographic magazine in June 1987, two Eskimo women from 500 years ago were found frozen in a tomb of ice. They had severe osteoporosis, as predicted by the Eskimo diet, which is very high in protein. Uh, modern Alaskan Eskimos are known to have a 10 to 15 percent bone deficit compared to USA whites. A woman's age, her family history, and her overall health are more accurate than bone mineral density for prediction of fracture risk. Okay. Um, soy protein, 25 grams, was substituted for an equivalent amount of animal protein for seven weeks each, and the isolated soy protein was just as damaging as the meat protein to the bones. And the reference came from USA Department of Agriculture with additional support from the beef. I'm no fan of soy, but it sounds like maybe the study was biased against soy. It was funded by the beef industry. Anyways, we'll, we'll leave it at there for today, and we'll, we'll come back to this uh, renal protection topic and osteoporosis in the next video.